The East African crude oil pipeline, ECOB, is facing fresh hurdles after several insurance companies reportedly opted out of insuring the project following pressure from climate activists who argue that the project poses significant pollution and human rights risks. The 1,443-kilometer pipeline from western Uganda to the Tanzania Indian Ocean port of Tanga is planned to pass through areas of sensitive ecological importance, including national parks and wildlife reserves. Dekins Kamugisha is the executive director of the Kampala-based Africa Institute for Energy Governance. He tells viewers Douglas Mpuga that these organizations are trying to make sure that this project does not destroy livelihoods of Ugandans and the country's critical biodiversity. Of course, we are still in court. We are still organizing communities to ensure that they reject any attempts by investors of the eco to allow that pipeline to pass in the water catchment of Lake Victoria to allow the oil activities in the Machon Falls National Park. So the communities are still resisting those attempts. We are still mobilizing financial institutions and the insurance companies not to fund the project. And indeed, many of the banks and insurance companies are still saying no. But of course, you still have Total and the, the government of Uganda still pushing. We've seen a number of decisions being made, but we still hope that our efforts are going to ensure that this project does not destroy our people and it does not destroy our critical biodiversity. We understand some insurance companies have pulled out of the project, given your concerns. But have you had dialogue with the government itself to make sure that environmental concerns are taken care of? We've really had a number of discussions and meetings with government, with the companies. But as you know, the government of Uganda it prides in using impunity. A number of us have been arrested, have been put in detention claiming that we are stopping investment. So instead of them actually accepting to discuss and ensure that we can come up with a settlement or a strategy that can ensure that, yes, if they want the project, that project should be done in a manner that it does not violate people's rights, it does not endanger our critical ecosystems. The government is always trying to use fear, harassment, intimidation, arrests, detention, not to allow the people who are saying, no, you must discuss, you must save our people, you must save, save the environment. So even when we try to dialogue, we try to meet, it is still a very big challenge for government to accept those meetings. Are the government, according to the government officials, are making progress in getting financing, at least the financing part of the project. Do you think the government could see bulldoze through the project without addressing your concerns? Of course, we know companies like Sotar is a, is a very rich company. We know the government of Uganda will, is desperate to start production of oil. And we know that because of that desperation, they can accept even the most confused and very complicated terms. So we know if they allow the companies, they give the companies very good terms, they can proceed with the project at the expense of Ugandans. And that's why we are engaging with Ugandans, empowering Ugandans to understand, to appreciate the consequences of proceeding with the project that is financially and the environmentally not tenable. That's Dekins Kamugisha, executive director of the Kampala-based Africa Institute for Energy. The Economic Community of West Africans, this ECOWAS, has urged what it calls the political class in Senegal to urgently restore the country's electoral calendar in accordance with Senegal's constitution. This after President Macky Sall abruptly postponed the February 25, 2024 presidential election and the parliament followed on Tuesday by pushing the polls to December. In a communique on Tuesday, ECOWAS called on Senegal stakeholders to shun violence and other actions that may further disturb the peace and stability of the country. Abdel Fatahou Moussa is the ECOWAS Commissioner for Political Affairs and Security. He tells me that the decision by President Macky Sall and the Senegalese Parliament goes against the fundamental principles of this sub-regional organization.
ECOWAS is saying that there should be re-establishment of the electoral calendar that would take the, into cognizance the constitution of Senegal and also the protocols of ECOWAS so that we are not outside the realm of the law. When you say the protocols of ECOWAS, what is happening in Senegal? Does it infringe on the protocols of ECOWAS? Yeah, the, uh, some experts indicate that because 12, uh, six months to elections, you cannot sort of change the laws governing electoral processes and constitutional processes in a country. And what we are seeing is that what the parliament decided in the wee hours of today also fall under that situation where the protocols of ECOWAS on change the law of the constitution within six months of the election have been infringed. So we are cautioning the country to make sure that their own constitutions and the equal protocols are not violated by what is going on in Senegal today. When ECOWAS says that Senegal should re-establish electoral calendar, the Parliament of Senegal has uh, postponed the election by 10 months. So are you saying this electoral calendar, when it is re-established, should fall within the 10 months or go back to original date of the election? The thinking of ECOWAS is that what the parliament has decided we think it is against both the constitution of Senegal and also against the fundamental protocols of ECOWAS, which clearly state in a supplementary protocol on democracy and good governance that you cannot modify electoral laws or the constitution within six months to the elections unless with the approval of the majority of stakeholders. We feel that the decision of parliament does not meet the requirements of uh, what the supplementary protocol says. So all we are saying is that Senegal should be within the laws of its own constitution and should not also violate the protocols of ECOWAS. Those are the, our two main demands. When I have you on the line, I wanted you to uh, talk to me also about what's happening in Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. Has there been any uh, official response from ECOWAS to the decision of these three countries to leave ECOWAS? Yeah, uh, listen, we have responded to them because the very first statement they made was on TV in uh, both uh, Niger and in Bamako, saying that they were withdrawing. Uh, ECOWAS membership is not based on collective applications. So those three countries cannot apply to leave ECOWAS when they didn't apply collectively to join ECOWAS. They are also to be aware that you cannot withdraw from ECOWAS within a period of 12 months. So since then, each of the three countries has written to ECOWAS saying that they would want to withdraw. We say fine, but none of them has repeated the public declaration of the three countries that they are withdrawing from uh, ECOWAS with immediate effect. Abdel Fatahou Musa is the a Commissioner for Political Affairs and Security of the Economic Community of West Africa. This he was speaking with us from Abuja, Nigeria. Maloding Highness killed a man and wounded two people near a university outside the Kenyan capital, officials said Tuesday, prompting hundreds of students from the school to block streets to protest what they called a lack of security. One of the wounded was a student at Kenya's Mount Media University who was attacked by the Highness late Monday on a road that borders the Nairobi National Park in Ongata, Longai. Students from the university disrupted traffic there Tuesday as police used tear gas to disperse them. The university is not safe because we are near the national park, said Ochieng Kafer, a student at Mount Media University who was among the protesters. The government should or maybe put some restrictions on the movement of the animals. 
The injured student was identified as 21-year-old engineering student Kevin Mwendwa, who lost a thumb in the attack. A team that was sent to investigate the scene of Monday's attack found body parts of another victim of the highness, the Kenya Woodlife Service said Tuesday. KWS Problem Animal Management Unit team promptly put down one hyena and moved to identify any surrounding hyena dens. The carcass was being examined to determine if the hyena had rabies or other diseases. The man who was killed was Anthony Pasha, whose relatives said he was killed while correcting firewood. The hyena came. It attacked him, chased him from the forest, put him down here. Kaji Rezian, the victim's cousin, told the Associated Press he left his firewood exactly where you are seeing them. Haina attacks have become increasingly frequent on the outskirts of Nairobi, prompting Kedarius to release guidelines on how to react when confronted by the animals. If faced with a hyena, do not move away until it does and continue facing its direction. Be loud, look aggressive, and appear fight, frightening to deter the hyena. The DKWS advises. The guidelines were released in January after 10 year old Dennis Taylor was attacked and killed in a field in Kiambu County, north of Nairobi.